Hey, what's up, guys? Have you ever wondered about 1031 exchanges and how you can harness this very important provision under the tax code? Well, in this episode, what we're going to be doing is going deep into 1031 exchanges, talking about some of the nuances that affect a lot of real estate investors that they're unaware of when it comes to taking advantage of a 1031 exchange. And I can think of no one better to do this than Aaron, who has a background in 20 years of real estate finance. He's actually the lead 1031 exchange consultant for Plenty Financial. It's a group that we use here at Anderson. They're one of the largest 1031 exchange companies in Southern California. And Aaron has insisted hundreds of real estate investors just like you in evaluating their real estate investments and consulted on deals ranging from 100K all the way up to $100 million. So with that, it's a real pleasure to have Aaron on board. Aaron, how you doing? I'm doing great, Clint. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Hey, yeah, it's going to be great. I've been looking forward to this because there's so much to dive into when it comes to 1031 exchanges. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that talk about the basics. And as I stated, I want to go deep and I want to talk about some important subjects such as cost segregation, how that affects the 1031 exchanges, joint ventures, build the suit, things like that. But before we get into that, maybe you could tell the viewers a little bit about Plenty Financial, your background, and then let's move into just the basics of a 1031 exchange. So if there's some viewers that are joining this and watching this for the first time, they're wondering, I've heard about that, but I don't know what the hell it is. If we could just briefly touch on that and then we'll go deep. Sure, understand that. Yeah, and we do hear that quite a bit. But Plenty Financial, we're what's called a, a 1031 a qualified intermediary or uh, accommodator. So those are kind of interchangeable terms. Uh, we have over a 40 year history here. The owner's been here with this office over 20 years. So we've been helping uh, real estate investors uh, all over the country, all over the all 50 states. Uh, we uh, consult with quite a few realtors, uh, CPAs, uh, attorneys. Uh, we always try to help uh, clients with a strategy before they get involved in their transaction, because as you mentioned, not too many are, are fully aware of 1031s and how exactly they work. But it is a uh, a nice tool that every investor needs to know about and, and, uh, and apply in, the, in their business so that they're not losing a large chunk of their proceeds. When they sell an investment property, it's within the IRS tax code to be able to uh, sell an investment property, buy the replacement uh, investment property, and not lose a large chunk of their profit, which can be 30 to 40 percent uh, in the process. So generally speaking, with setting up a 1031 exchange, can you know, if I have a property and I'm considering selling it, then how does that work? What should I do if I want to get involved in a 1031 exchange? Sure, excellent. The first thing would be to be consulting uh, with their CPA and with a qualified intermediary so that we can go over uh, all of the transaction information or the, or the uh, pr proposed transaction information. Uh, as far as setting it up, it does need to be set up before they actually close. And so we'll talk about some of the timelines but uh, for sure, it does need to be set up before they actually close on their property. And in that way, uh, the escrow agent or the closing agent, their attorney, uh, knows exactly what to do at, at closing so that it qualifies and is part of the exchange. So if I have my property under contract right now and I haven't yet closed, I'm two weeks out from closing, better yet, I'm three days out from closing, mm -hmm. could I still do a 1031 exchange? You can, fortunately you can. We have clients all the way up till the day that they're closing call in a panic because they didn't realize they needed to set it up ahead of time and we, we accommodate those. We don't recommend it, but uh, for sure, we can get it set up within just a few minutes actually to make sure it's done uh, before the, the funds are actually dispersed. The biggest challenge uh, with that is uh, if it's not set up before closing and those funds are dispersed to the client or to the exchanger, uh, that's considered constructive receipt by the IRS. And so they're going to be taxed on that money. So that's part of the exchange rules is it has to all be set up. There's a couple things on the settlement statement that need to be done. Um, and then when those funds are, are dispersed, it's going to come to the qualified intermediary to hold. And then it's uh, sent over to their closing agent to close on their replacement property. Okay. So if I was someone considering selling a piece of property right now and Maybe I didn't know that I wanted to do a 1031 exchange. Wouldn't it be then wise, would you say, just to structure it as a 1031? Because if I get involved with this and I can't find replacement property or I decide, eh, I'm just going to take the funds and I'm going to go buy a boat, I can back out of this at any time. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. It's always uh, wise to do it just to, in case to give yourself that option. 
that's one of the misconceptions that pe when people just try to go it alone and read online, they, they see that they have 180 days to buy replacement property. But that's only if they had already set up the exchange before they closed on a sale property. Again, once they close and they have that money and then they try to exchange, they don't have any chance. So they kind of can look at it as a little bit of uh, insurance, so to speak. It's kind of like capital gains insurance. If you're not sure what you're gonna do, just go ahead and set it up and give yourself that opportunity. Otherwise, you won't even be able to do it. Yeah, all right, so then if, you know, let's say I have a piece of property, it's valued, I sell it for $800,000, I have $400,000 debt, so after the loan payoff, there's $400,000 that is held by the intermediary um, to be rolled into the new property. What do those numbers look like? I mean, when I start looking for a piece of property, I believe, what, you have 60 days to identify, if you could touch on that, and then sure. what type of property should I be looking at price-wise to make sure I'm not going to be taxed? Sure, absolutely. So let's start with the, really the basic rules of not having to pay that capital gains tax because it is quite common right now. Somebody may have just bought a property a couple years ago for a million dollars and now it's it's appreciated so much, maybe double, they're selling it for two million, which sounds great, but they're gonna have that three to $400,000 tax hit on that profit if they just sell it without exchanging. So what would happen is there's two basic rules if they don't wanna to have to pay that capital gains tax is first, they have to take all of their proceeds, all the equity out of that sale and put it into the replacement property. The second part of it is they need to buy equal or greater value than what they sold. Now, when they read up on that, they're gonna hear about the, uh, the debt replacement. So in your situation where you have a $400,000 loan on an $800,000 property, uh, they have again have to buy a $800,000 property or higher in order to not have tax. So usually they're going to have to have another $400,000 loan to make that happen. That's what debt replacement is talking about. However, if the person has cash and they're looking to get a free and clear property, they don't want to deal with a mortgage, they definitely can bring in cash. So the main rules are that they're taking any proceeds that they're getting out of that sale and putting it into the property and also that they're buying equal or greater value than what they sold. Those two things will mitigate that capital, ta uh, capital gains tax bill. Okay, so what I'm hearing, and I hope everyone else is as well, is that just look at what you sold the property for. If you're trying to figure out how much you need to roll into replacement property, whatever you sold it for, that's what needs to be rolled. Is that a simple way of summing all that up? That, that's a very simple way, and that's exactly how we try to help people simplify everything that they're reading to understand it. Yep, replace what you currently have with your new property, or it can be multiple properties, as long as the total of everything that you're buying is equal or greater value than what you sold, then you're gonna be okay. And it doesn't matter how you put that deal together. You can come in with cash, you can come in with loan, maybe you're trading your dog to get this property, but as long as you're getting it for the same price or more, you're clear. That's correct, yeah, then you're gonna be clear on that. That's exactly correct. Okay, now, since we're on that topic of rolling money in, um, I do wanna talk about something here that, I, that does come up, and that is for people that have cost sagged their properties, because this is, really popular now with bonus depreciation, will they go in and, the, and they'll break up their property and say, all right, this, the useful life of the, this portion of the asset was five, seven, or 15 years, and I'm gonna expense it out with the bonus depreciation 100% this year, you know, if it was a couple of years ago, or 60% or now. When that money, or when we're doing an exchange on a property that I've done a cost seg on, let's say I've pulled out $200,000, it's my understanding that that portion is taxable to me unless I can find replacement property that has equal property inside of it, you know, landscape and all that, that it equals what I did on the original property, cost sake. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you always need to be finding equal or greater of what you did that to. And, and you gotta be keeping track of the tax basis along with those as well, because that is rolling into the new property. That'll just roll over. But in order to not have the tax, it's all about exactly replacing that part of it and making sure it's equal or greater value for sure. So it's the depreciation is what we're getting at here that 
that can trip some people up then uh, yes. on a 1031 exchange. Yes. In fact, uh, when we say the total capital gains tax can be 30 to 40 percent, that trips a lot of people up. They're usually quite surprised wondering where do we get that number from. They're thinking capital gains is just 15 percent, which when they read up on federal tax rates, they just see 15 percent and think that's it. But in reality, that can be 15 to 20 percent, depending on their tax bracket. They have the state capital gains rate, which here in California can be 13.3. But then that depreciation, everything they've been writing off in depreciation, which has been nice through the years, but when they go to sell, the IRS wants 25% of that back. It's a de depreciation recapture. So all of that is the total of what they'd be owing the IRS if they just sold. And that easily equals 30 to 40% of their profit. Got it. And then when you do roll into the new property, since you've already depreciated it, you're rolling your existing basis. So if I bought a if I sold a property $800,000 and I had a tax basis of 200000 then in my new replacement property, my tax basis will continue at 200000 unless I buy up. Is that unless correct? you buy up. You said that exactly right. Yeah, it's going to roll over. If they just buy equal value, it's just going to roll over and, be, and continue on with that same basis. If they buy up and have additional value, that additional value would be added onto the basis. And this is where it's really important for their CPA to be involved uh, ahead of time so that they know what they're doing and can be tracking that for them. All right. So here's the question that I get a lot, and that is, what about on the replacement side? If I'm selling an asset, maybe it's $2 million. It's, it's commercial. And now I want to buy residential. Number one, the first question for you, is that a like kind? So going from commercial to residential. And then two, if I ha sell an asset at $2 million, how many replacement single family homes am I able to close exchange into? Excellent questions. I get these all the time myself. So that like kind part with the IRS rule trips everybody up. And so we get people saying that all the time. I'm selling a duplex, but I don't want to buy another duplex. They think they're pigeonholed into that. And oftentimes they just decide not to exchange and they're paying hundreds of thousands in tax unnecessarily. The like kind with the IRS, all that's referring to is just, it, it's an investment property that you're selling and you're buying another investment property. That's the like kind. So investment property to investment property. Within that, the type of property itself does not matter whatsoever. So if they're selling that duplex and they want to put it into a single family, they want to put it into an apartment building, they want to put it into a commercial property, as you mentioned, you want to go from commercial property to residential. Uh, even uh, vacant land is considered investment property. Uh, triple net lease properties, uh, DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trust, which are you know, more of an investment type of uh, situation. But all of those are allowed within the 1031 exchange rules as long as it's being considered and used as an investment property. Okay, so in that particular context, how many properties can I buy? Right, so with that, again, they can buy any number of properties uh, as long as the total value is equaling or, or being greater than what they sold. And now we're seeing that all the time. For instance, here in California, people are selling, maybe they're getting a million or two million out of a property and they want to diversify. So they're taking it to you know, Texas or Florida or where have you, and they're buying three, four, five, even sometimes 10 different properties. Then you total up all the value of what they're buying, as long as that's equal to what they sold, then they're going to be okay. Well, then what's that identification rule that you have? You know, three properties. You know, if I want to buy 10, how do I identify 10 if I'm limited to three, right? Or right. maybe I misunderstand that. Yeah, so good question. So actually we missed the timeline part, so I'll explain that a little bit. The, uh, with an exchange, you have a timeline. The total of it's 180 days. So that starts from the day that the property sells. You have 180 days to close on your replacement property, or if it's multiple properties, they all have to be done uh, by day 180. The first 45 days of that though, is the identification time. So by day 45, if they haven't closed on replacement property, you literally turn in a list of potential properties and then you have to close on ones on that list uh, per the IRS. So that's a good question what you're asking. Now deeper than that, so if you're gonna turn in a list, how many can you put on that list? Well, most will put on up to three. The IRS allows up to three at any value. So if you sold for a million and you want to list three at a hundred million, you're totally fine. 
However, if you list more than three, that's where there's going to be a cap. The IRS will now cap the total value of all those that are on that list at 200% or double of what you sold. So, okay. so if somebody sells for $2 million, the total of everything they put on there is going to be $4 million if they're going over three properties that they're identifying. So in that case, where they're trying to buy 10, usually they're buying a bunch of maybe $200,000 properties. Uh, in that case, it's fine. Uh, but they might run into some trouble if they're trying to buy higher end properties, several of them, and they only sold maybe a $500,000 property. Okay, so how about if I want to buy a property and this property needs a lot of work? And so I'm getting a deal on it. So I sold a property, going back to my $800,000 example again, and I find a replacement property that is $500,000, but hey, it needs to have a whole new, new roof, landscaping, windows. I mean, there's just a lot of new driveway. And so I estimate that I'm going to put into that property several hundred thousand dollars to rehab it just so that I can rent it. How does that work in an exchange? Sure. Yeah, that, there's an excellent way of handling that. It's called a construction or we call it an improvement exchange. So the funds can be used for improvements. So what's happening in that situation, they've sold for 800,000. They find this great replacement property. It's only 500. So if that was all they did, again, by those rules we've discussed, they're going to have some tax between the difference of what they bought and what they sold. Uh, so in that situation, they have some money still sitting in the exchange account, or even if they don't have money because they had uh, a loan on it, they still have this room that they can send in to go towards improvements. So what happens with an improvement exchange, uh, it's really neat. Before they close on that purchase property, the accommodator, the qualified intermediary, which is us, we actually take title to that property when they initially close on it. We have all the agreements in there in place, uh, escrow and title uh, will understand. They'll get some additional information from us. But we're holding title now during that 180 day period. And what that does is it allows the exchanger now to use the funds in the exchange account to do those improvements. And as those improvements are being paid out of the exchange account, it's being tacked on to the value of what they bought. So now they've bought a property for 500,000. They've done the 300,000 in improvements. And now we have to deed that property back to the exchanger by the end of the exchange. So by day 180, it has to all be deeded back over. And now they get the new value, that 800,000. So they got improvements and they're not paying the capital gains tax. Now, another cool thing about that is all we're really looking at is that the money is being paid out 180 days. So if somebody sells and they buy a property and then you're gonna to try to improve a property, it might be very difficult uh, to get all the improvements done within that short amount of time. But it's the money being paid out of the account is what counts. We have invoices come in, we have money that goes out, and as long as that money has been paid out by the time we deed it, that's all going to be counted uh, in the exchange. Okay, so here's a strategy. Maybe it doesn't work. Let's assume that I have a contractor that I know and trust, and I, it, it took me 120 days to close on this property, but the rehab is going to take another 120. So I'm going to be 60 days past my 180. Could I negotiate with the contractor to do a fixed bid contract prepayment up front for all the improvements and have you pay the contractor to do all the improvements, even though they haven't been all completed yet by the exchange rate? And would that qualify then? So if I, so if I had that 300K and I said, all right, boom, here you go, contractor. Here's a full $300,000. I know it's going to take you a while to get this done. But as long as it's out of the account, it's in the contractor's hands, does that qualify? There you go. The key on that, you said, Clint, was that it's a contractor that you know and trust. So that is between you and the contractor at that point. Yes, that can absolutely count. It's uh, the nice thing. It, it, this isn't like a construction loan. You're not going to have a lender coming out and inspecting mm -hmm. the property, making sure everything's been done. We're not looking at appraisals and that type of thing. Literally, if we have an invoice that comes into the exchange and that money gets paid out of the exchange, yes, absolutely, that's going to count. How about if I ran it to an escrow? So if I paid it over to the escrow for the benefit of the contractor? So <laughs> as long as we have an invoice, 
For, all you need is an invoice, we need an invoice right? and hearing. we need the money being wired out of the uh, the exchange account and that's going to work <laughs> nice yeah well, people are picking up on that okay so then another thing i'm thinking about let's assume that uh, my father has a building and he's tired of operating this property and i want to buy it and i do that in exchange 1031 exchange from my asset into his asset there's um it, that, so that's going to be a related party transaction. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some rules attached to it. So depending on uh, who who you're buying from, who the related party is, and then who you're going to be selling to. Uh, in most cases, if you're buying from a related party, it, the IRS is kind of funny on these rules. I didn't make them up before you start asking why this is. Yeah. But if you sold to a non-related party, which is usually quite common. You just put it on the market. You don't know who's, who bought your property. Now you want to turn around and buy from a related party. That usually isn't going to work in an exchange. That's called a related party exchange. But for whatever reason with the IRS, if you sell to a related party and now you're going to buy from a related party, if everybody holds on to their property for two years, that can work in an exchange. So this is where someone's really going to have to get involved with their CPA, perhaps some... Um, you know, their, their tax attorney uh, for, for specific guidance on their situation. The IRS has some rules around that because they're afraid of, uh, they call it cost-based shifting. Perhaps they're getting special, yeah. you know, treatment from a family member. So they're going to have some rules around that. So each situation, that's why we want to talk to the person up front and make sure they understand it. Yeah, but so what I want people to understand, though, is that's a potential. And, they, and don't walk away from a deal just because you're dealing with a relative. Mm -hmm. that you can possibly put this together, which then makes me think as well, I've heard about incidental. So if I'm buying a property and, you know, I've always wanted to own, let's say, a, a Kubota tractor, and I'm going to need that Kubota to do some trenching work and move dirt around on the property for landscaping. Isn't there a rule where I could buy a Kubota and still wrap it under the exchange? Well, you're, you, what the IRS is going to look at... Uh, if they ever do an audit, would be different mm -hmm. than, than what we might look at. But it does have to be real property, basically. Now, that's going to be wrapped into the contract somehow and included. That's going to be fine. But usually something that's not real property, for instance, if somebody's buying a business and that includes the real estate, usually those amounts need to be separated out. So it does need but to be real estate. there's an incidental rule that if, it, if it's less than 15% of the thing, you could classify as an incidental and roll it up under the exchange as long as it's part of the asset or it could be that maybe I miss it that uh, yeah and that doesn't come up I'd have to refresh my memory on that part of it yeah on that I, yeah. I we rarely see that come up but there is ways of putting that in there and that's where we make sure that they're checking with their uh, their tax attorney on that part of it with what they're putting into the contracts so that it can all be classified as real property perfect so Look for properties that have a nice, you know, 32 foot Grady White, <laughs> like to fish and make that part of the yes. deal. Just comes with the garage. There you go. <laughs> exactly. All right. So now I, I've done my exchange and uh, I've closed on the new property. And now I'm looking for some funds. Can I go in then? So I, I did all cash. So let me rephrase this. Back to my example again, $800,000. There was no debt on the original property. I sold it for cash. I take that eight hundred thousand dollars. I buy replacement property. When can I go and do a cash out refi on that after I've closed on the replacement property without there being any tax consequences? Yes, yeah, excellent question. And and just for those you know watching this, the reason for that question is a lot of times people are always asking, well, when do I ever get money out of this? Because if you, as long as you keep selling and exchanging, you're not going to pay that tax, right? But then they think, well, wait a minute, how do I ever get cash out of this? Well, one of the best ways is to put that cash into the property, buy it for cash, and then turn around and do that, that cash out refi. It's, you're not, it's not a taxable event. Uh, and just do that right after you made the purchase, then you're fine. <clears throat> so we're always advising oh, for that. So there's two, basically two ways. One is uh, pulling out cash boot out of the sale. So if somebody only needs 100000 or so, they could elect to take it out of the sale and pay cash or tax on that cash and then exchange the rest. But the best way is putting it all into the replacement property after it closes, uh, just turn around, do a cash out refinance. Now you have that cash and you don't have to pay the tax. Okay. 
Now, what happens if I find a uh, replacement property, say, in Dubai? So you, you may not know this, but we have an office in Dubai, and, and we work with a lot of investors who are, are now investing over there. And so if I'm here in the, in the States and I want to go out to Dubai and buy a property, can I exchange into that property and would it qualify? Good question. Again, that goes back to the like-kind rule as far as properties. So we discuss it doesn't affect property type. However, it will affect international properties. So like-kind also will apply to something sold within the United States would need to be replaced within the United States. Now, if they sold a property international and then buy international, that is like kind. But crossing the, the, the borders, going from United States to international, that wouldn't be considered like kind. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. So, since we're asking these questions, what happens if I've got a partner? So, a lot of people will joint venture on deals. Let's say they go in and they buy a multifamily and they own it in a limited liability company and they decide they want to do a 1031 exchange. Can you touch on what they have to do in order to make that work out for them? Sure, yeah, and this also comes up all the time. I just had a client the other day asking the exact question about this scenario where he had invested into a project with a developer. Uh, I think they're building 10 homes or something like that. They're getting them pre-sold and he's kind of lining things up. But what happens with that, since he's invested, what we have to ask is who's actually on title uh, to those properties. And in this case, it's an LLC, so it's like a joint venture. You have all these investors that have come in, but the LLC actually owns the, the property. So again, within an exchange, what the IRS looks at, they call it continuity of taxpayer. So the taxpayer that sells is the one that's gonna be reporting that on their taxes and reporting the exchange. So if an LLC owns the property when it's sold, it's actually the LLC that's going to be buying. So what they'd have to do, what, it, what we've explained to him, is if he wants to be able to exchange just his portion, I think he might have been a, maybe a 10% uh, investor or something like that. Well, he's got to negotiate uh, being put on title as what's called a tenant in common. He's got to come out of that LLC. He's actually got to be on title with a percentage. Now that percentage is gonna come out at the close of escrow and he'll be able to have his own 10% that he can exchange out and make sure that now he's just replacing the value of his 10% that was sold. That has to be done ideally six months or more in advance, just that the IRS doesn't look at it as manipulating things and not have to pay tax. But that happens a lot where somebody has to be dropped out of an LLC to be able to exchange. It's called a, a drop and swap. So they're getting dropped out, then they swap and do their exchange. So you just said something there. You said six months in advance. That would be ideal. So that's why we have to be Sorry. thinking of this ahead of time. We have clients that do it right before because they're already in contract and never asked about it. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, we can't tell them exactly what will happen, but uh, we just make them aware. This, you know, the IRS could ask about that. Ideally, plan ahead, and uh, if you have to be dropped out of an LLC, do it plenty of time ahead of time. You know, I've had discussions with clients before about 1031s, and they said, you know, I bought a property, I've held on it for six months, and, and now I want to sell it under a 1031, and my tax advisor said it wouldn't qualify. And I've always taken the position that that's incorrect advice that it's an intent-based test. If you bought the property with the intent to treat it as an investment and you held onto it for six months, you didn't hold onto it for a year, and somebody came along and said, hey, I'm gonna give you five times what you paid for that and you sell it, it, would, it should still qualify because it, what was your intent when you bought the property? How did you treat the asset? And so sometimes I feel that, and correct me if, if, you're, if you differ on this opinion, that the idea that you have to hold something for an entire year before it becomes investment property, I don't, I've never read that in the code. It doesn't say you have to hold it for a year. It just states that you, you know, what was your intent in acquiring the asset? Did you intend to hold it as an investment or was it an inventory? Yep, I'm explaining that to people all the time, Clint. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge misconception. I don't know where one year hold even, even came up. Um, but that's exactly right. When, when somebody asks me how long do I have to hold property, well, the IRS doesn't say. There, there's nothing written yeah. in there where you're going to have a, a number of months, number of years, and um, they're getting this advice 
uh, just based on maybe safety. Let's just be conservative. But uh, that's exact. It's the intent. So you've held property as an investment, and what they'll say is you're going to buy property that you're going to quote unquote hold as an investment property. That's it. So if you held it for a month, two months, now something better came along, or you realized, oh, that wasn't the right property for me, but you show that the intent was to have it as an investment property, then sure, go ahead and sell and exchange it. Okay, so let's flip the script now. I'm not selling, I buy. So I buy a property today and I'm thinking, you know what, I need to free up some cash. I'd like to sell a piece of property to get that cash freed up for this acquisition. Can you do a reverse or something? I, I forget what it's called, but it's rather than buying first or selling first and buying, can't you buy then sell? Yeah, you named it. It's called a reverse exchange, and it's just for that, that exact purpose. Uh, yeah, so if you're going to buy a property, so you found that perfect property, and uh, you, you don't want to pass it up, uh, you don't want to take that chance of missing it, and you're able to you have the cash or, or a loan or, or the combination of the two to be able to close on it without needing to sell, then by all means, you can buy that property first. Now that 180 days within the exchange, you have the whole 180 days to turn around and be able to sell your, your property tax free. Now the way that works, it does again, it takes some, a little bit of extra work to, to set up ahead of time. So as long as a client knows that it's a possibility, let us know so that we can all be set up. What happens is the accommodator uh, again needs to get involved by holding or the IRS calls it parking uh, one of the two properties. They can't own both properties at the same time. So if they just bought that property and now they own the, the, the replacement property and the sell property, it's too late. So we step in, we'll park one of the properties, either the one they're buying or the one that they're selling. And that allows them then now to exchange. When the property that they're selling closes, that money comes to us first as the accommodator, and then it can be reimbursed to them tax-free for the purchase that they already made. It helps them to be able to lock up the perfect property when they see it. And it takes care of that whole 45 day rule because they already bought the replacement property. So now they don't have to worry. They just buy. Now they have the whole 180 days to sell. So there's two ways you do it. One is you just buy it, financing, cash, whatever, titles held in your name, right? When I buy it? Correct, yeah. We could either we could either have it held in our name or we can deed the uh, the sale property, but one of the two would we'd have to be held by us, correct. So if you hold the property that I just purchased, then the property that I'm selling, where do those, who holds that pro or the proceeds from the sale of that? Does that come to you? Correct. So they're buying initially with their own funds. So yep. we weren't involved in those funds. When they sell now, now those funds are going to come straight to us from escrow or, or their closing attorney. And so instead of them sending it first to the client, they just send it to us first. Then we can turn around and send it back to the client to reimburse them for the funds they put in. Oh, God. So on that type of deal, I don't even need you for the buy. I just need you for the sell. As far as the funds part of it. But yes. yeah, you do need us though to have it set up and have the titling, everything already arranged. So we have to have the, the whole exchange set up. But for the funds part of it, that's correct. Yeah, the funds are not going through us for the purchase at that point. So when I, when I close on that property, say I buy a building tomorrow, do I close in your name or do I close in my name? We set it up one of two ways. Our ways that we like to set it up to make everything streamlined because what can happen is if the, if the property they're buying is held in our name and they're trying to get a loan that they can run into issues. Yep. And so we've really streamlined the process to where what we do is we have a, a deed, they'll have them draw a deed on the property they're gonna be selling. Uh, it's an unrecorded deed. So we have a, so contracts, leases, the whole bit to where they stay in, in charge of the property, they're, they still manage it, they can sell it, they can do what they want. We get a deed, it's unrecorded, and now that satisfies that that property is parked and allows them to close on their purchase and uh, we don't run into any financing issues and so forth with that. Like, could I also do this? Let's assume that um, I don't close on, just negotiate with the seller. Listen, I need 180 days to close on this property. I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, 10%, 15% earnest money. And then 
I don't even close on it until I get the exchange proceeds from the sale, and then that goes to the seller for closing. And then I get reimbursed for the money I put in. That, would that qualify as well? So in that case, it, it goes by which one is closing first. So if they're still closing on the sale first, right, then that's still a standard exchange. That's going to come to us first. It'll all go to escrow to close on the purchase. Now, whatever money they put in for their deposit, so they put some money down to hold as a deposit, mm-hmm. that can get reimbursed in at that point out of that, those closing funds. Got it. Yeah. So that basically then, so I would sell my property. I've got 180 days to close. I negotiated with the seller. Then I just turn around, identify that property mm-hmm. that that's what I'm closing on. And then we go to closing on that. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And that's the most ideal way. If you can find a yeah. seller that's willing to make a contingent uh, sale and, and give you time to close on your sale, that makes everything a lot more streamlined, of course. But yeah, that's exactly how that would work. Okay, interesting. Now, how about if I want to sell multiple properties and roll them in? How, do, how does that work? Right, exactly. So we've discussed somebody buying multiple properties, of course, is fine. There's a little challenge that can come up if somebody's selling multiple properties and put them all into one or, or into a few, you know, which is fine. The challenge is that each one of those sales is its own exchange, and they're each going to have their own timeline. So are they gonna be able to sell them all at the same time or maybe within a couple of weeks of each other? Cause they're all gonna have that 180 day timeline with the 45 day uh, identification time. And uh, they gotta start then really with the timeline of the first exchange. Cause if they take too long, that first exchange is gonna get blown. So a great way of handling that, if the sales are gonna be spread out a little bit is we can combine the exchanges. It's a great tactic of doing a standard exchange to set up that first or maybe two sales at the, the initial ones. Now they, we set up a standard exchange for each of those, and then they can go ahead and buy their replacement property, but when they purchase that property, we set up a reverse exchange. Now what happens when they close on that reverse, that's gonna give them that a whole new 180 day timeline from the close of the purchase. Now they can go finish selling their other properties. That's done quite a bit in those circumstances. It's like a combo exchange. So, so what I'm hearing is you roll part of it in, you come in with the, a loan or cash, and then that gives you the 180 days to go out and sell the other stuff to get reimbursed and pull it all together. That's exactly right. It's buying time. Theoretically, you can end up doing this for a year, right? You have 180 days from the time you sell your first property to close on the purchase make that into a, a, a reverse exchange and I have 100, another 180 days. So you just bought yourself a whole lot of time to be able to complete those sales. Interesting. How about if I wanted to buy a personal residence? Can I sell you know investment property and go out and buy a, a home? Yes, so this comes up at times. Uh, somebody, especially if they've been investing for a long time and they wanna find that perfect retirement home now. Here's the key to that, is we've talked a little bit earlier about intent. So the IRS is going to look at what your intent is. So the best practice is to buy that home that you really like, that you want to live in down the road, but you need to show it as an investment property, at least on the first two years of tax returns. So list it for two years. Now at that point, hey, something came up in life, something changed, you need to move into it, then that's the time to do it. But you can't show the intent when you make that purchase that that was your original intent, but list it at least on two different tax returns as an investment property first. So here's how I see creatively you could do this. A, you build the property. Uh, We talked about that earlier. If it takes you, well, no, you run into time issue there because if it's built to more than 180 days. (laughs) So you don't, you only be able to roll in whatever you get built with. Whatever you can build or however much, again, if you have that contractor you trust, you don't mind paying them up front. So that's a possibility. (laughs) All right. Well, how about this? So, so I, uh, you know, you don't want some a bunch of strangers in the house that you're building to be your, you know, your personal residence. So you rent it to your daughter or your son, or you rent it to your corporation. So you show income coming in that show, comes up on your 1040, right? Yeah, corporation's the best bet on that. You you can definitely rent to family members. Uh, we yeah. we get asked that a lot. You definitely can. We just, we always recommend have a rental agreement and be renting around the market rate for rents. If you're giving them a sweetheart deal where they're just paying for electricity, the the IRS could question if that's truly an investment property. But yeah, absolutely, that can be a way to have that managed, to have somebody that you know and trust taking care of your property for those first two years. 
Now, now I hope people are picking up on this because what we just gave them was a strategy where you sell an investment asset, mm -hmm. you don't pay any tax on that, you roll it into your personal residence that you, you're eventually going to uh, move into. And then when you move into it, you sell your primary residence right now and you exclude up to 500000 under Section 121. You just put that money in your bank account. So you're actually taking advantage of two provisions here in the Internal Revenue Code to not pay any tax. The only caveat, as I understand it, is you've got to live in it for five years before you can do a 121 on that property. Yeah, the 121, that's the, the personal residence. Now, mm -hmm. it's actually, it's two out of the past five years, and it's any two of the past five. So if you've lived in it two out of the past five, you can take that, that 250000 as a single person or 500000 for a couple. Now, here's a nice thing about that. If you're really planning that one out too, before you sell it, if you've been living in it, you can move out of that and rent it for a year, show it on your tax return as an investment property, and now you can exchange the whole thing without paying the tax. So again, it takes a lot of planning ahead of time, but just realizing these are options, somebody can you know, work the whole transaction without paying that tax bill. Yeah, now, see, I'd put a caveat on what you just described. I take it to a little different level. What I like to do is I tell them, move out of that house after you've sold it to your S corporation. So you enter into an installment sale with your own S corporation, and then you can increase the tax basis in that property for a future sale when you finally decide to sell it. And then you elect out of the installment sale reporting. So you still get the $500,000, you pick it up, right away, you lucked out of the installment sale, so your basis goes up. So there's so many different ways, like you said, to, to work these deals. And most of the time what I found is that people, they don't reach out you know, to like yourself, calling you, calling Anderson before they do this, and then our hands are tied because they've made some mistakes or they've already taken some action that we can't unring that bell. Which brings me to this, and that is Deferred Sales Trust. I'm sure you've come across that strategy. What are your thoughts? That one I haven't dealt with. You have to fill me in a little bit, Clint. That one usually has fallen from what I've seen outside of our 1031, but you can fill me in on that one for you. Well, so, so this is what people, I, you know, I've had individual clients approach me on this before and they say, I've got this company that I've met, typically a lot of them are out of California or Utah. And the strategy is I then sell them my house and they put all the money, or no, I tra uh, sell them the house on an installment sale. They then buy the house and then they turn around and sell it to the person I intended to sell it to. They collect all the funds and since I haven't received the funds, they hold on to those, they invest them and then they pay them back to me over time. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for them to sell a property without having to buy replacement property and typically those proceeds get reinvested into something else entirely, like maybe it's going to go into crypto or, or, or the market or something like that. Right. Yeah. That's what's great about when we tell them, hey, you know, talk to your tax attorney. That's exactly what you're there for. course, so they understand they have all these other options. It's, you know, without, you know, the 1031 is one realm and then they have, you know, plenty of other options as well to go. Absolutely. Yeah. I was just wondering if you ever came across that because, you know, I, I look at it as, as a disguise sale. Because, um, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, intent, you know, your intent on this transaction is to really never sell it to this party. Your intent was to sell it to the other party that they're selling it to. And you're just a straw man. Right. To get it taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. There's, a, you know, like I said, there's a lot of stuff here. So what are some of the major mistakes that you've seen that, that real estate investors have made that blew up their exchange possibility? <laughs> So the first one, as I mentioned, ones that never set up an exchange, really. They, yeah. They've already sold, they have the money, and then they turn around and ask. So that's just number one. They don't even have an exchange, unfortunately, and they're going to pay the tax. Um, the second ones are, are some of the ones we've talked about where they're just not buying enough property or they're misunderstood. They're thinking that they get to take their initial investment out of the sale property when they sell. Mm -hmm. That's very common mistake. You know, maybe they put 200000 down on a $500,000 property and now they're selling for a million. They think they're going to get that 200000 back and they just exchange whatever proceeds are in the exchange. Um, and then 
some will never believe us, even though we try to tell them, but they'll have a tax bill the, the following year when they go to report that sale. So, uh, so those are usually some of the biggest mistakes that we see are just ones when it comes to the reinvestment, not buying enough property and not understanding that if they touch any of the money, even though they put money into the deal, the IRS looks at it as they're pulling out out of the profit first and they're going to get taxed on that. So the way you pull money out is via a loan. You go to a lender and you get a loan. That's exactly the way to do it. That does not trigger a tax bill unless you sell. Got it. All right. So there have been there's some talk now. Um, I know Biden proposed changing the 1031 exchange rules uh, in his budget proposal that we now limit it to 500,000 or a million for a couple per annum. So you can only defer. So if I was selling a two million, if I had two million dollars in gain built into a building and I'm single, I can only defer five hundred thousand of that, and the rest would be taxable. Uh, have you heard this before? Have, have, have other administrations tried to do this? And what do you think the likelihood of something like that passing? Right. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, and it's not the first time that it, that it's been seen out there. It, it seems like it's something that almost is just uh, automatically put into bills to make it look like uh, something's being done about taxes or, or what have you. Um, so it's usually always put in there, and it's usually always something that comes right out. The reality of the situation is uh, the effect that that would have on the real estate market, and, and that's known. Uh, it would just bring everything to a halt, and and uh, and it. it you know, just be horrifying, the, the cataclysmic, you know, what would happen if everybody just stopped selling investment properties because that would cause so much tax. Everybody uses it. It's part of such large plans, even by the politicians themselves on writing those bills. So just from what we've seen from history, it's usually always starts off in the bill. It makes them feel good, like they're trying to do something, but it usually comes right back out. Yeah, that's been my take as well. I've been telling people, hey, they're just trying to buy votes. Yeah. And so they're going to throw that stuff out there to people who think the rich real estate investors need to pay more in tax. So right. I'd like to single us out. Yep. Well, hey, uh, this has been really enlightening. You've answered a ton of questions and given a lot of value here. Uh, in closing, is there anything you'd like to, to say to the pr individuals that are watching this right now? Yeah, and it's a little bit of a recap, but it, I think hopefully what everyone's understood is that 1031 exchanges don't have to be necessarily complicated or you know be included in the shroud of mystery not understanding how it works uh, the key is to go ahead and give us a call or, or get you know get your uh, strategy team involved ahead of time uh, just go through the potential numbers and the transaction it's going to clear up a whole bunch of things for you before you get involved and find out the last minute that something wasn't done right um, so that's that's the biggest part just uh, you know get everybody involved and, and get your questions answered up front Awesome. Well, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to put a link in the show notes below. So if somebody wanted to get a, a hold of you, they could just go right there and click on that link. It'll take them over to you. And other than that, thanks for taking the time to come on here today and, and share with us all your information when it comes to 1031 exchanges. I appreciate it. Sure. I appreciate that, Clint. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.